Welcome to Real Estate Investing for Professional Men and Women, the podcast that guides professionals to financial prosperity. Join our community and let's start building your wealth. Here's your host, Gary Wilson. Hi, this is Gary Wilson and welcome to this week's podcast, Real Estate Investing for Professional Men and Women. Welcome aboard, dentists, engineers, pilots, teachers, firemen, police, and all of you. Uh, and chances are some of you actually own a business. In fact, a lot of you already do. We can tell that. So welcome aboard. Uh, if you have not subscribed, please feel free to do so. This is now on 30 some odd channels, including, of course, including, of course, Stitcher and uh, iTunes and iHeartRadio, all the biggies. Um, and also, if, you, if you're interested in being a part of the community, or there's thousands of us out there now all over the U.S. and Canada, and uh, where this is not the no money down, smoke and mirrors, you don't have to have cash or credit kind of stuff. Yes, that stuff's possible. I've done it. This is more for people who just want good old fashioned meat and potatoes. You know, you, you want to you have skin in the game. You understand. You learn how to actually flip a home or buy a rental or get a rental managed. That's really what this was about. OK, we got some great stories and great examples. We've got one today. Um, so in any case, so you can go to myinvestedservices.com, click on members area, and you can you may already be a member already. And if not, just click on the right button. And you can kind of test the water, so to speak, and see what this is all about. Communicate with everyone, network, do joint ventures, all kinds of possibilities. Uh, every, we're, all, we're all alike, and uh, we're all not alike either. Uh, we have one thing in common, is just the way we go about our investing, and it's definitely a win-win for everyone. The community wins, we win, the, the, the renters win in the case of rentals. Um, everybody wins. And that's, what, that's, that's when you know you have success. So, in any case, uh, for today, we've got a great guest. Uh, David Evans is a friend of mine. And uh, we work together as, as, as you know, it's a teacher-student relationship in the in the past, and uh, I value his relationship, my relationship with David and his family. Um, and I think you're going to enjoy this. So, so David, welcome aboard, brother. Thank you, Gary. It's, it's really great to be here today. Thank you so much for having me on with you. You're welcome. Hey, would you mind just uh, I, you know, I, obviously you're in the Atlanta area and you've lived other places. Would you mind painting a picture for everyone? Uh, that's you know who is who is David Evans and it'll provide some context because then we can jump into some projects you've worked on or working on now and it'll might make a lot more sense you know okay yeah I'm happy to do it well I guess uh, as as a man of faith I would say that my you know the number one answer to that question is that uh, David Evans is is a child of God I'm a man of faith however um, it has been a circuitous route and I would say it's been in many ways a professional route. To faith. Uh, it started off uh, with my education as a mechanical engineer, and then I got my master's in mechanical engineering and did biomedical engineering as a professional for uh, well over 15 years, uh, in, in addition to other engineering I practiced. And the, the, the entrepreneurial bug bit me while I was a professional. I started investing part-time like many of you may be doing right now, I started with just buying and holding multifamilies, which was a, was a fantastic way to get the real estate bug to bite me. Um, and, I, and, that, and that one happened by reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Robert Kiyosaki got me started in the game. I went out and bought my first three family and uh, my journey began. And as I moved on and progressed, uh, I realized that the professional world and being in the company uh, environment long term wasn't where I needed to end up. And uh, I made the big leap. So I made the big leap out of the cubicles and the office environment and into, uh, you know, walking on the dirt and, and looking at new properties and, and, and helping others as well. So I'm, uh, I uh, started off by actually moving countries. So I moved from the United States to the Philippines for a while and I was doing some startup work there. And then I uh, landed back here in the United States in the Atlanta northern suburbs. I live in Cumming, Georgia, which is a northern suburb of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And I've been selling real estate here for about four years, continuing the investment route and uh, growing into it into some new home construction uh, a little bit there, as well as continuing to help other investors with their project. And I've even started doing some land development deals. Awesome. Well, I know you've, uh, and obviously I probably know more about you than, than most people, at least in our world of real estate investing and brokerage, because we work together. But I know you've been, you really went from um, dealing with uh, the entry level type stuff, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, and basic flips, 
into doing some pretty big things here, but would you mind talking maybe um, talk about one of your projects, maybe the triplex or maybe that flip you did last year, um, middle of the road, average, we call it bread and butter type thing, uh, just to kind of describe your experience and then we can maybe move into something you're working on. Or maybe, maybe something that worked and something that didn't work so we can be practical and let people know that the, the world is, uh, it's not always, uh, things don't always work out the way you think they will, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, you know <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, maybe share, so maybe share one or two of those projects and uh, this, I think this is going to help a lot of people, you know? Sure. Well, it's interesting. Um, despite the fact that, you know, I have the, I do have the aspirations for the bigger things, I still, I still continue to, to sell properties and I also still continue to do kind of the bread and butter type clips. And, and I think the one that uh, you might be talking about is, is one that I did earlier this year. And uh, it was a first sale by owner. Uh, it was a house that was in a little bit older neighborhood in, in Forsyth County here in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, right by the lake, Lake Lanier. It was actually really close to the lake. And we found it for sale by owner. And we were able to get the house for uh, basically $123,000. Um, it was just a three-bedroom, two-bathroom house. Just uh, about, I think it was about 1,100 square feet. Didn't need a lot of renovations. Um, and it was just that the person uh, had inherited it from their family member. And they were they were what we call a don't want her, you know, they, they didn't want it, you know, they, they just needed to move on. And we were able to find, uh, get that house. And literally it was, it just needed some uh, paint and some carpet, needed some minor repairs here and there and needed the lawn cleaned up and, uh, and, and a bunch of cleanup work really essentially to clean it up and make it really look good. And uh, we turned it around. We invested a total, I would say about $131,000 uh, we got it under contract for uh, $175,000, but we ended up selling it after the appraisal. Then the appraiser came in and, and uh, adjusted the price down to $168,000. Uh, but I would say that, I mean, that was a pretty good example of a bread and butter flip in this area of the country that um, that worked out and everybody was happy. We had it sold uh, um, within three months to a, to a younger new family. Um, they just had a baby and they, they were looking for for their first home and they were excited to get into it. And, um, you know, my father and I partnered on this one. We got it um, all fixed up and flipped and, and sold. And right at the 90 day mark, cause it was an FHA loan, um, we, we, we got it closed and, and moved on to our next project. Wow. Well, it sounds like a real win-win. I mean, the person that's selling, sounds like it was, a, they did get no water, so they got what they wanted. Um, the buyer with the young family got what they wanted. And of course, you, you we call it prosperity through service. You serve two others, and as a result, you prosper. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that right. sounds pretty good. And it was a, so was a net somewhere around a thirty thousand dollar mark. Dollar mark. I know you probably had taxes to pay and all that stuff, but I mean, cost basis well, for say, sales is roughly, roughly thirty. Would you say our target was around thirty? But then my father decided to have a heart <laughs> for the folks that were selling, uh, that were buying it, and help them with their closing costs and oh, nice. other stuff. So. And, and yeah, and so there was also there was additional fees. We ended up making on that house eighteen thousand dollars. Hey, so that, when all was said and done, all expenses were taken out. We made eighteen thousand. That's not a bad day's work. That's a if you think about it, you've had one hundred and thirty somewhat into it. Um, that's about a fifteen percent return after. That, that's pretty good. I know we always shoot for twenty or thirty. Then you have ten percent carrying costs. So twenty. So you were just two two points below the twenty. But the reality is, on a dollar for dollar basis, that's that's pretty darn good, you know. Right. Uh, it was a three month turnaround, and not a, not a twelve month or a six month. So we exactly. actually we we turned that. We would have actually had it sold quicker if we weren't waiting for the FHA deadline right. to hit. We actually would have had it sold in sixty days instead of ninety. Yeah. Well, I know. Um, in my experience, Dave, I was. Once I really figured out that this is a business and I was going to treat it like a business, you know, I would rather make, you know, eighteen, twenty thousand dollars five or ten times a year than attempt to make two fifty once a year, because when I attempted to do that, it ended up taking three years. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got those as well. I've got stories. <laughs> that's right. right. And that's why I really like to not do I don't I don't like to 
look only at the big deals and only look at doing big things. I, for me, I feel like continuing to, to sell real estate as a realtor, in addition to investing myself, while, while I'm looking at the bigger deals, it, it is a better way to diversify my portfolio so I can just keep things chugging along in a good direction. You know, if you're anything like me, listening to good advice is helpful and inspiring at the same time. But having a reference guide at your fingertips is invaluable when I sit down to do serious planning. That's why if you go to the website, myinvestorservices.com, at the very top of the page, actually sort of near the middle, you'll see five different guides on five different aspects of real estate. All these are free and all of them can help you impact your bottom line. Just check it out. Go to myinvestorservices.com. Right smack in the middle, click on any one you want or all five if you want. Well, if you wouldn't mind, is there, is there one that's, that sticks out in your mind you were thinking, boy, I, that was a real learning experience and, uh, you know, um, you now you know what not to do kind of thing, <laughs> you know? Just to help people. <laughs> oh, help people. Yeah. I, think, I think you know the one, Pierre, yeah. you know the one. Uh, <laughs> same year. <laughs> Last year was an interesting year for me. Yeah, I had one. Uh, it was a big one. Um, <clears throat> kind of like, I guess you figure, you know, Dave Ruth really swung for the fences and he was the home run king, but, uh, he was also the strikeout king, as I recall. Yep. And, um, when, when you swing for the fences, like I did with this deal, um, I, I, you know, I probably wasn't as, uh, thinking as much about the, the potential for the strikeout as I was thinking about the home run. And, uh, so I, I really, I swung for the fences with a, new home construction in um in the, in Atlanta we have a luxury area called Buckhead which is kind of the more high end mm-hmm. area of Atlanta and um i um i i had a a friend of mine who is also a, a realtor and a commercial real estate broker and he mm-hmm. approached me with an opportunity for a new home construction in that area now i um i had no experience building new homes my background was the multifamily buy and hold bread and butter um, doing you know small flips and medium flips, but this idea intrigued me, and it certainly fit the market profile uh, in my mind because Atlanta has been booming as far as the economy in, in general, and specifically this area of the country has been booming. Mm-hmm. And so I, I knew that there's just a lot of a diversification of industry in the area. I knew there's a lot of demand, and um, I know Buckhead uh, is is a, an extremely desirable area. He found a lot uh, with what we you know we. I guess in development terms, I call it a fill-in lot. It was just uh, a lot that was available in an established neighborhood that had not been developed yet. Now, the lot next door was was the was being uh, developed as a new home construction. Mm-hmm. And what it was is it was an old home that had a double lot, and they knocked down the old home and they were building a new home. And then they split the lot and they were giving uh, an opportunity to to purchase the lot beside which we purchased, which was a raw land lot. To build, um, basically, we were targeting about a one and a half to one point seven million dollar house mm-hmm. in that area, um, and uh, I approached it, coming to my partner, saying, "Look, I, you know, I've never built a new home construction, so I'm really going to have to rely on your experience and your expertise, and I'll, I'll back you up financially, but I'm, I'm really kind of along to, to kind of, kind of lean on you as, you know, I'll be the financial partner, and you've got to be the expertise partner." And he had a a friend who had worked for another builder who had been building in that area for a number of years. And this friend um, claimed to be a GC that had built seven or eight of these homes, almost mm-hmm. identical to what we, the floor plan we were building. So we felt confident based on those conversations and based on the homes he showed us that he had built and uh, moving forward. And, and we did, we started getting uh, things. And at first, actually everything went really well. I mean, it was our partnership and our, uh, you know, our friendship and everything kind of uh, was just clicking along just right. And, um, you know, we got the budget pulled together and we started getting the vendors online. We got the lot, we got the loan that we needed. It was a hard money loan uh, for it. And we got the loan uh, based on the experience of the general contractor and my partner's experience having built, uh, I think at that point he had built four other homes in Atlanta, but they were smaller. They They were in the, what I would say to, a three to six hundred thousand dollar range, and this okay. was his first time attempting a luxury home as well. Um, and so we everything went along just fine. And then all of a sudden, um, the general contractor stopped uh, stopped hitting milestones. 
Uh, <laughs> I'd say that started happening early on. <laughs> and, um, you know, I wasn't as intimately involved at that point. Um, and so I was kind of leaning again, relying on my partner to kind of follow up with the general contractor because that was his role was to execute. And my role was to fund and, and, and watch the checks as they were going through. And I started writing checks less and less frequently, which meant that the the vendors weren't showing up as often. Um, we mm-hmm. had some weather issues. We also had some challenges with the um, the local economy was so heated up that um, I really felt like, you know, it, it, we were competing with these big builders in yeah. order to get the, you know, the, the vendors to show up. And uh, we, we were just the little guy. So that became a major problem. And then we, it just got slower and slower. And then the rains hit. And we got hit with a bunch of rain. So we had uh, a bunch of uh, literally months and months of rain hitting us. And so what ended up happening is the GC just basically kind of threw in the towel. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, and and I don't, I'm not exactly sure at what point he decided to check out, but it, he did. <laughs> and um, it, it all kind of, the, the project kind of slid out of control from there. And once the GC checked out, my partner, he kind of, he just didn't seem to have a backup plan. He didn't have a plan B or a plan C in line. So he basically didn't quite know how to manage the situation. And what ended up happening is over a series of months, we basically kind of had to put him on a corrective action plan. And that took a long time to follow up. Meanwhile, we were paying interest on the uh, hard money loan every month. We were yeah. looking at it's about a twelve thousand dollar nut a month that mm. we were looking at just on interest, and uh, so then we were we were so we started missing the uh, we started missing our budget numbers as well because then things got more expensive because we lost momentum without having vendors being managed properly, and uh, we ended up switching general contractors, and that's that's when I jumped in. I found a uh, found a general contractor. Uh, and this is, again, I'll point back to kind of the faith element in this part, you know, because there was just at this point, it took it took a lot of humility on my part to just, you know, recognize that I don't have all the answers. I don't always know what to do in the minute in the moment, but I do know somebody who does. And so right. I just I, I really just I just prayed about it. I literally just prayed. I don't know what to do. And. Lo and behold, my wife, who had been talking to me a long time about, hey, why don't you call this other, you know, friend of ours who goes, to, you know, who's happens to go to our church and we happen to to know through small group. Hey, why don't you just give him a call? He's a general contractor. Mm-hmm. And um, I did. And uh, and he ended up um, kind of being a, a little bit of an angel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that he, he, he came in and said, I'll help you out, Dave. I mean, that was how he said it. And it was just you know, just a heart of gold, salt of the earth personality. Mm -hmm. Um, And he, he took over a project that was basically what I would consider at that time. It was a bit of a hot mess. Yeah. (laughs) And he jumped in and he rolled up his sleeves uh, and I took over a project that was a hot mess. And I basically took it over for my partner and, and he went from being the lead to being the secondary. And I went, I went from being secondary to being the lead first time building anything, me and this general contractor got our heads together, rolled up our sleeves, and we just started slugging through it. And um, we, uh, we we were able to build up momentum again. And uh, this was last April was when we started diving in. And we were able to get the, the house completed in September. And literally two days, we got it under contract before we had our certificate of occupancy and we were able to close literally two days after we got our certificate of occupancy nice. and uh, get through it. Um, yeah. Fortunately, also my wife was a huge help. She jumped in from a design standpoint and helped us really clean up and harmonize the design because there were some, there were some very good design elements. We had, we had a designer. She had, she had done a pretty good job, but there was some really discon- discontinuity, uh, especially with budget. Like she was, she was just, you know, specking top of the line, top of the line, top of the line for a spec house. And right. you know, just taking responsibility, I'd say, was a huge, uh, a huge learning in that. Even even being kind of the primary investor, you just have to you just have to stay on top of it. It was, it was a huge, huge, huge learning. And um, I'd say going back, learning back on it, I would have um, I would have switched sooner uh, now if, if I were in that situation again. Yeah. Um, you cut you, you you cut off the dead weight earlier, 
uh, rather than, you know, as soon as you recognize it's dead weight, you know, I had two layers because I was going through a partner to get through the GC. Um, and he and the GC were the ones that were communicating. I was actually taking a step back, but, um, in the future, I would say, uh, the learning I took would, would be to jump in, you know, if things aren't working out, waiting is not the solution. (laughs) Right. When when you know it's not working out, just, yeah. you got to dive in and take action quicker yeah. rather than later. And that was a that was a big learning for me. We we use the analogy of plumbing problems. Plumbing problems don't ever get better on their own. <laughs> They'll get worse. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, so I lived that analogy this past this past year with this project. This project yeah. was definitely a big old leak, a big financial yeah. leak, and, and that's what can happen. Is and, and that's why I'd say with the big risk um, comes the big rewards, uh, which yeah. is all I was looking at was the potential for the rewards. But that risk is also needs to be balanced and, and brought into the equation. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's a, it's a it's a challenge because our human nature is to want it to work out. So we tend to be sometimes more more patient. Um, and the reality is, though, as soon as you see the trend changing, just like in a a sporting event, like a football game or basketball game or baseball game, when you see the momentum shifting, it's always the same thing. The people that wait, the coaches that wait, end up not winning. The ones that that react quickly can sometimes, you know, pull the thing together and end up being victorious. So, so a great lesson. I appreciate you sharing that, by the way, because I could, you're, you're kind of pouring your heart out a little bit. And and I think that means a lot to people because I want people to know that it's a, you know, there's things that don't work out. Um, learn from them, no matter what you do. And there's a, a, a I met somebody. Uh, what was his name? Um, unfortunately, he was born with only one leg that actually had a fully developed foot and toes and everything. The other leg was not developed at all, and absolutely no arms, no arms. And he said, mm. when he was old, his parents told me, he said, you know what? We're going to send you to public school because. You're going to you're going to live and you're going to grow and develop. You're going to find out yourself being more and more independent. And we want you to 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 learn how to to do things on your own now and be independent. Um, And he said, as a result, he learned early in life to expect that there were going to be troubles. And I thought, what a profound lesson. It makes he said, because that way he's not stunned initially. He's things to hurt. He has problems and things don't feel great, obviously, emotionally, mentally, physically, and every other way. But he's able to jump in and take action more quickly as a result. And I thought, what a profound lesson, you know? So, yeah. so yeah. with flipping for listeners, expect that they're going to be challenges. They won't always happen, but when they do, at least you're, you're mentally prepared ahead of time and not having to go through that emotional, uh, you know, being stunned, you know? So, yeah. Emotional yeah. resilience, I think, is key to, to, to kind of pulling out a win, even when you're faced with the adversity. Well, I appreciate that, Dave, because you know, I know you, you mentioned that before we started recording this is being persistent, being persistent, consistent, and never underestimate the resiliency of the human spirit. You know, there's That's a great. famous scripture, Ephesians 3.20, you know, we're, you know, God working through us is far more powerful than anything we can possibly think of or imagine on our own, you know, <laughs> so, um, yeah. so you got to have faith, you know. Yep. And that's and, and many, many times throughout the process, that's, that's about all I was at. That's all I had was my faith <laughs> because, you know, sometimes you can't see how it's going to work out and you don't know just from a budgetary standpoint. Um, yeah. I, I face a number of, you know, and you will, you can potentially face a number of months where you don't know you've got more months than you got in, in, in your bank account. You yes. know, there's just, you're not sure how all those bills are going to get paid. But what I can say is not, not one of the subcontractors got left out in the cold. Not one, you know, the general contractor that helped me out. We, uh, I had even borrowed money from some of my family members in order to make this project work. I was able to pay them back. I was able to pay all of the, um, all of the subcontractors, um, you know, and I absorbed, I took responsibility. I think the other thing that I think is, important to to note and i i believe um mm-hmm. it's important to for, for my my reputation is is to maintain at what point what is most important is it making the money or is it preserving a reputation and and, and moving forward with integrity right. and i i really felt like moving forward with integrity meant that uh rather than absorb like, spreading the losses out amongst the people all around me which 
I, I can I, I can understand how some people may rationalize, well, hey, it's a loss. We all got to share it. Um, I, I chose I chose the other route. I chose to absorb the losses and make sure that everybody who I encountered was was paid because I personally valued those relationships more than I right. value any one deal. And, and, and that would be something that I would just kind of express is that building a reputation and building those re- relationships, um, yeah. it's, it's kind of like building the goose rather than just going for the egg, the one golden egg. It, you really want that right. goose to, to, to grow. And, and I'd say that goose comes from those relationships and the reputation that you build. If I went back to that hard money lender today and said, hey, I need another loan, they would say, yes, sir, you can get one, I bet, because yeah. they got paid. <laughs> yeah. Well, so. you, when you also, you took personal responsibility for it. And at the end of the day, even if the world didn't know what you did when you took personal responsibility, you know, the people involved know, God knows. And the fact is, the way you walk and carry yourself is going to reflect that, you know? Right. So I, and it, and it takes faith to be able to do that. But I tell you, whenever in my life, I've, I've, I've just said, okay, just rely on faith. It always works out we, without fail. But it's, it's a hard thing to do. How do you define faith? It's a difficult thing to define. Guys, you just have to experience it. Just, just know it, you know, it's, and you know, it, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll realize you'll have that, that understanding usually after the fact, because it does, faith is, you know, it's, it's like you're going into something, your confidence is in God and not in yourself, you know? <laughs> so, that's right. What and, that's, and that's a hard thing to do because yep. we're, we're so programmed to believe in ourselves and, and believe that our power that we have within ourselves is somehow going to pull us out. And at the end of the day, you know, we have we have an entity up there that's rooting for us. You know, yeah. we have we have a person out there who knows so much more than us that really wants us to succeed from in the true sense of success. When I say true success, it, it, it goes beyond, you know, there's. One thing that's important to know is, I mean, there's there's a spiritual element to what's going on and what we yeah. do here. I mean, yes, we're dealing with money. Yes, we're dealing with physical buildings. And yes, we're dealing with physical land. But I would say the the, the higher level spiritual elements, which which are engaging our operations on a day to day basis, they need to be uh, recognized. You know, whether you you know you jip that that subcontractor in order to kind of you know get your bottom line a little bigger. Well. You've made an exchange. I've made an exchange. If I were to do that in the spiritual realm, and and so anyway, yep. uh, not to not to go off too far uh, off, yeah. uh, but I, I figure it, it warrants mentioning that uh, right. I think there's more than one balance sheet that we're looking at. Absolutely, it all, that's where it all starts. You know, it's funny when you when you when you just when you really allow yourself to to recognize and, and develop, participate, and and live fully in that in that. That vein here, our our spiritual connection with God is everything else materially seems to work out. It, but it, it's a hard thing to do. But it, but that's it's just the truth, you know. So, but I tell you what, listen, yeah. listen this up on a victorious note um, when it comes <laughs> to, the, to the material stuff. So I know you and your dad were working on a couple of couple of big projects. One in your Gulf Shores, Alabama. One up in North Georgia. Um, yeah. Would you mind talking about one of those, like the the, the land deal? Because it's like the funny thing is, is you got through that one. You started off the year great and had the had had the, the learning experience, and now you're 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 uh, something else looks like it's working out for you. You know? Yeah, it is actually. Um, the, this this was a this was a deal in a, in a in a city here in the Atlanta area in Holly Springs, and I actually partnered with uh, another partner, a different partner who had uh, a good amount of experience doing land development. Now, this is a success story, and this is finding a partner. Who knows what he's doing? Uh, this time, however, although I was um, I was invested financially in this deal, uh, I definitely was involved from the beginning physically. I was much more engaged in the process from from the get go. And what we did is we we put 18 acres under contract, and uh, this was a land development deal. It's a mixed use deal in uh, Holly Springs, Georgia, and it was uh, multifamily. So we put 18 acres under contract. And we went through the what we call the entitlement process, and that's where you basically go through the zoning process in order to make sure that everything is rezoned appropriately for your your targeted use. And mm-hmm. so the highest, what we call the highest and best use for this land was multifamily, and it was in the in the corridor that was uh, 
in, in the plan, the city plan for multifamily use. And it was up to 16 units per acre. And we were able to, um, to find a partner. So what we did um, for this property is actually a flip, uh, kind of a combination of a flip as well as a buy and hold all at the same time, which uh, I guess I would call it a hybrid deal. So we put mm-hmm. all 18 acres under under contract and we got this, uh, we found a partner, an apartment developer partner who wanted to purchase the apartment portion of a mixed use deal. So we ended up with about 15 acres on the back of it that were for apartments. And then we had uh, two commercial out parcels remaining on the front. And so what we did is we maintained while the property was under contract. So we had to we had to put our earnest money in. We also had to go through our due diligence. We had to, you know, put out expenses for due diligence, which was pretty significant on a land deal like this. But we found a partner. We partnered with them. They went through the entitlement process with us, giving us floor plans, giving us elevations, supporting us in the meetings mm-hmm. through the um, planning and zoning commission, and everything was approved. Um, and we ended up closing on that deal. I would say that was literally about three weeks after the Buckhead deal closed. So we had uh, a bit of a, you know, the roller coaster went down and then the roller coaster went up and we, uh, we closed on everything. We, we cleared, I would say on that deal, we cleared about, oh, I'd say the total profit between my father, me and my partner was, uh, that was about, uh, well, let me say it was about $280,000 in profit. Nice. Uh, plus, we, yeah, between the three of us, uh, plus we ended up with uh, the two commercial out parcels on the front. Uh, and so now we've got two commercial out parcels on the front that we're able to, to go off and um, look look to find uh, partners for those as well. Um, we're, right now we're exploring um, land lease options for maybe uh, fast, casual dining uh, establishment. Wow. Well, that's awesome. That, that's that's new new to me, and I appreciate you sharing that because that's uh that's um I know, I know that's right up Mackey's alley, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. Well, that's pretty good stuff, Dave. Hey, I tell you, we're actually getting close on time here, but um, I what I want to do is uh uh, as you shared three projects, and I appreciate you being open and candid about that because uh you're you know this is a way for us to serve others and allow them to be practical and see that. Um, it's not like what is see on late night TV where everybody wins all the time. That's, that's not real. You will win no. more of the time by being persistent and consistent and, and absolutely having faith. I, 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 you know, just, I know everybody's different. We, we, uh, but I tell you, living by faith is far more powerful than, than not. And I, I don't know how to describe that any further than the, what you sh- the experience which you shared here on the podcast today, but, are there any final words of wisdom you can share with people? Like, by the way, I want people to know if I can give you a plug that you you are a practicing uh, real estate agent in, in North Georgia. Um, you got experience with owner occupants, of course, and also with the investor stuff. But but if, if, if that part of the U.S. is still very very um, uh, tempting and desirable for a lot of investors, whether they're in the U.S. or outside the U.S. I know a lot of Canadians are investing there. But um, how do they yeah, get a hold of you? Are you a, a website, a, uh, an email address? Absolutely. And if you wouldn't mind, share a few parting words of wisdom, because I always value our relationship. And you you know I've relied on you as a, as a grounding rod for me, too, in the past. And I, I always appreciate it. It's a lifelong relationship, and I'm very grateful for it, you know? <laughs> so. Well, Hal, I'm, I'm, I'm mutually grateful, too, Gary. I, I really appreciate uh, our relationship. I've learned an incredible amount from you, uh, not just on the practical side, but also on on how you live, how you choose to live as a man of faith. And I, I appreciate that. I'd say kind of my, my final words, I would say, is that I want to give all glory and honor to Jesus Christ. He is my Lord and Savior. And I just want to really put that out there as yeah. that is kind of my beginning. That's my alpha. That's my omega. All of this uh, stuff that I do in the investment is, is subject to what I consider to be the, the larger, the larger picture of, of the Great Commission, and and so my my interest is in um, kind of seeing how what we do in this life can can resonate into eternity to the to the benefit of as many people as possible. So that's that's the first thing I, I'd like to say. And secondly, if if anyone is interested in continuing continuing the conversation 
with me about what opportunities do exist in the North Georgia area, in the Atlanta area. Um, I do uh, work all along uh, the, the Georgia 400 corridor, all the way up. Um, I'll even go up into Dahlonega and Lake Lanier. Uh, my phone number is 678-842-3680. And you can also reach me at davidevansrealestate.com. That's my website, davidevansrealestate.com. And my email address, you can reach me at my, my brokerage. I'm with Keller Williams Brokerage. So you can reach me at david.evans, E-V-A-N-S at kw.com awesome well there you go folks you got a way to get a hold of one of the practicing professionals on both ends of the of the real estate transaction service and personally wrote going himself financially and a, a solid man of faith and guys i can tell you I, I know david personally and um so this is a treat for me to have him on but uh, uh i don't i don't think i've ever said this in any podcast i've done but I definitely would personally vouch for him because I, I know him personally. I work with him and uh, I know what he's capable of. Just an amazing journey from, you know, starting where you were to where you are now. Just, uh, boy, what a, what a, what a great, what a bright uh, beacon of light for a lot of people, David. So thank you for sharing your time and valuable time. I know away from your family, it's, it's getting close to the, the Christmas. And uh, God bless you and your family and everybody listening. God bless you and your families, too. You might not be listening to this till after after Christmas, but I wish you a very Merry Christmas. Um, and may God bless you, you and your family with peace and prosperity and much love. So uh, thanks again, Dave. Thank you, everyone else. And we will see you on the next podcast. Don't, please remember to subscribe. Uh, my, you know, Real Estate Investing for Professional Men and Women. And go check out the community site on myinvestorservices.com. And I'll be glad to have you be, be part of the, the fellowship. Thanks for listening to this episode of Real Estate Investing for Professional Men and Women. Be sure to go to myinvestmentservices.com to join our community and start building wealth today.